took my car to a new mechanic by recommendation of others. A guy with oodles of experience, plenty of years under his belt, working on cars. So I introduced him to my baby, the minivan, and parted ways. A few hours later, you know, I got the word that the car was done. Some of the things were just the simple and routine stuff. Other stuff was like, just, just tell me when I need to shell out the big bucks, you know. But, so I, I go back and uh, the repairman was working on some gravel outside on the door of a really old car. And I, I went up to him with my cheery, you know, pastor personality. Because you're getting to know someone new and, you know, it's fun. I'm a, we're, we're people people. So, so I asked him, how long you been doing this? So how long you been doing this? You know, wondering how long he's been running a shop. His hair's all white and glasses on his face, sweat running down his bra. And he, he doesn't really turn to me. He just, you mean this car? How long I've been working on this car? And then he paused because he kind of knew, you know, and he just said, ah, far too long. So he was a little gruff. I think it was that kind of day for him. He wasn't, uh, you know, in the, in the same mindset that I was. And later on, um, so then he just says, well, I'll be with you in a minute. I'll be with you in a minute. And uh, yeah, that's totally fine. Take your time. Take your time. You do what you need. I'll be right over there by the register. So I hang out. He finishes up what he's doing and he's going to come and grab my keys and the paperwork, you know, and we can pay for things and whatnot. And uh, he said, yeah, sorry, it's just been one of those days where I can't get through anything. You know, don't have the parts that I need and can't get the parts that I need, you know. He was one of those guys, he didn't really look you in the eye, he was just always kind of looking at the side and just not the people person kind of thing. <laughs> but that's okay, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. And I said, you know, sometimes I'm still trying to bond. Sometimes I, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I said this. I'm a pastor, and, and sometimes I just, you know, wonder what it would be like to work with your hands and get something done. Uh, it doesn't always seem like that when you deal with souls. It's just not simple. It is just fix the problem, hand back the keys. And I said, well, you never know. He's encouraging me. Isn't that kind of cool? He encouraged me. You never know. I said, that's right. That's right. You're right. You never know. And then he said, well, I'm going to hell today because I've, I've used every word in the book. <laughs> that was his line to me. I'm going to hell today. I've used every word in the book. And it was humorous. It was a humorous thing. What do you say back to that? I mean, I wasn't prepared. It wasn't a line that you were like necessarily going to say something and like, I don't really know you and you won't look me in the eye. And you're kind of joking when you say this line, I'm going to hell today because I've used every word in the book. So I just kind of smirked and chuckled or whatever and finished paying and I was thanked him and I was gone. But what can you say there? Oh, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we... Isn't it just absurd and ridiculous what you can say to a person who says, I'm going to hell today? Because I've ever used every word in the book. I would be too, if it weren't for Jesus. Can I tell you about him? <laughs> There's the direct line, right? You know, you must be better off than yesterday if yesterday you were good enough you didn't need God. It's much better to be knowing that you're going to hell. Now I can give you the good news. Isn't that crazy? I'm going to hell today. I've used every word in the book. Oh, I've got something to say to this. I can catch your fall. I know I've got something to say that catches your fall. The good news of Jesus. You don't have to. You don't have to. I can, I can give, like, coming out of every pore and fiber. You can just fill this guy with the God's love and everything that he's done at the cross and forgiveness of sins. I mean, it could just boom, and it's just there and completely changes the direction, right? If he were serious and not just, I don't really know, I have to go back and I've got to get to know this guy, right? Oh, but it's just one of those things where you think about the absurdity of, of this space we get, to, we get to share together. The craziness of the words that fall off our lips in the forgiveness of sins 
and the very thing that we don't deserve. I know that you know all of this, but today we are tracking, we're tracking where love begins. We want to look at our lives and what we express, how we live under God. We want to think about that word love, and we have big heavy hitters to say that faith, that love flows from faith. Love and faith are just big words. And they shouldn't be the kind of words that lose their color and their flavor and their shape and what they, what they bring to us every single day. What is working when I'm competing with you? What is working when my toe is tapping in impatience with people? What is working when I'm envious of others' success? What is working when I'm so disappointed in you, I can't talk to you right now? What does it work? I often find, I don't know what you think, I often find that I'm at worst, at my worst here, when I'm most upset with myself, I'm disappointed here. There's something of a connection between our faith and our love. And Paul takes us right to the, the heart of this. We get to see what, what Paul does in the context of knowing how wide and deep and long and high is the love of God for him, the, the heart of his faith, and how it expresses itself in his ministry with Jews and Gentiles. When the missionary shows up, what does he get to say to people? And he recognizes that here, at the core of our faith, you know this, the, the, the truths of law and gospel as they express themselves and meet souls everywhere, we have things we can say for sure about God, and they're ridiculous that I wouldn't say in that moment, you're going to hell because, oh, we found a cusser. God, I found a cusser. Let the lightning bolt strike right here. We found a cusser. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say, oh, well, I have to wash my steering wheel twice if you touched it today, sinner. You're not going to do that kind of a thing. What else are you going to express? What goes on in your heart? Oh, there's all those words I haven't said before. You see where the distance shows up is my own proud arrogance. So Paul explores this. And in this section, he's talking about how does this work? Follow the stream of love. Let's go to the top. Where's faith? How does faith work? How does getting close to God, how does, how does operating in a life that's filled with the things of God, how does it function? And it's core. It's the start of the stream for us to later talk about expressing love in our lives downriver, okay? So we're going to go back up to the heart. And at the heart, I think of it like an X. And think of it an, an X that's drawn from left to right. What's your left to right? This way, like this, okay? Think of it like an X. And Paul says this, what do we say? What do we say when we talk about how it works? How do we get here that we can proclaim grace to infants in baptism? How do we get here? What do we say then, he says, that Gentiles, let's go with this line, Gentiles who start here at rock bottom, they're the pagans. They've got no commandments, no Moses, no Abraham, no deliverance history with God, no circumcision, no covenant relationship, no sacrifices, no temple worship. They don't even know God's name. He says, let's think about the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness. Let's just get that out there. They did not pursue God at all. And yet, when the missionary showed up and said, repent and believe the good news, they have all that they need for eternal life in their Lord Jesus Christ and have obtained the status of being perfect in God's sight. Wow. Is that what we say? Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Nothing. Nothing. And Christ, God's only son. What's the other side? What about the Jews? And that the Jews who did pursue righteousness, who talked about Abraham to their infants on their laps, 
who reviewed and memorized the commandments, who meticulously and scrupulously poured over every page of their Old Testament to learn and to know the will of God so they would keep it and observe it, who offered the sacrifices and called upon the name of the Lord, that the Jews, who had all of this going for them, nevertheless, they pursued it, they pursued a way to God as if it were by works, and they have not received their goal. They continue to build their Tower of Babel as if they're going to reach heaven by their own works and think that if I just get another foot, just give it some time, we'll get there. And they never reach their goal. It's this way. How absurd. But this is the way it works. This is, the, this is the way we talk about faith. And not only, as he then explores, not only do they end up in the wrong spot, but he wants to say, what's going on? What's going on in this landslide? What's going on as they fall off the cliff? What's going on in their hearts? And he exposes the problem of the heart. So if we're going to see how love gets downstream, we're going to see that that love does not show up from anything in our own hearts as he traces it back and he says it's because they were arrogant. They read their Old Testament in a surface relationship kind of a way, saying this is simple, this is easy, we can keep God's commands and he'll love us and he'll bless us. Hell does not need to be on our radar. It was arrogant. And so they stumbled over the stumbling stone, Paul says here, right? They pursued their own righteousness was arrogance. And did you know that arrogance has a way of not just expressing itself here, but here? And you see someone like the hand washers in our gospel from Mark 7. And they're looking and comparing with Jesus' disciples. How come they're not keeping their hands clean like the tradition of the elders? And they're all law-oriented, right? They're all like hardliners and, and, and strict. And you're not doing what we're doing. Their noses are all up in the air and they're standing tall, not just before God, but before other people. How come they're not keeping the tradition of the elders? You're eating with defiled hands and they're all about the letter of the law. They're all about who's getting the steps up and close enough to God that way. And it's lost it. It's lost the heart and core of that faith. It has nothing to do with the source of the river. Right? It has nothing to do with the core of our faith and what I get to say to someone who says, I'm going to hell today. There's none of it there. So in Jesus' parable, there's a Pharisee and there's a tax collector. Do you remember this? Just story time. And they're both at the temple. And the Pharisee is standing tall in the house of God. And is, I thank you, Father, that I am not like them. This was his relational approach to people. He's thanking God that I'm not like them. Does that sound like love to you? Does it sound like it has to do with God? And then there's the one in the back who's beating his breast and won't even look up. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's a dynamic at work when someone finally becomes a sinner that's so different from the dynamic of a law keeper. I think about your relationship with government. And as long as you're a law-abiding citizen, you're not wondering what are they going to do with me. Think about the new teachers, your kids. Kids, you've got new teachers at school or professors. All's, all's rosy when you're obeying the laws and you're sitting with your hands folded and you're listening right to the teacher. But what's your new teacher going to do when you disobey and you talk out of turn? Whole new dynamic there. Talk about a friendship. A friendship that builds. I think dating is a lot like this. You bond and you grow and it's happy and it's fun and you arrange dates and it can all kind of be calculated and when I got the energy for it, that kind of stuff, looking forward to it. And then you get married and you start to like disappoint each other. 
and hurt each other. And now you get into what's, what's there. What dynamic is there when the disobedience comes? What dynamic is there when a friend shared a secret with you and you leaked it? When they shared their favorite thing with you and you lost it? Or broke it? Now what? How much stuff do you have? How much glue is there in the relationship? What is it going to fall on when you, when you hurt someone? What's it going to fall on? That's what Paul is talking about when people become lawbreakers. And suddenly that space, the I'm going to hell today person, finds out what is God going to say? What stuff is there in the core of this faith? We're tracing the stream. We're going to talk about our relationship with God. What do I find there when they get to the mountaintop and the snow is melting down into the stream? What is it like? Can you believe how absurd it is that when I'm hitting the bottom and I say, I've given nothing to you, Lord. Paul says, this is what we say? that they've obtained a righteousness in the stone. Whoever believes in him will never be ashamed. And his name is Jesus. This is a relationship that is deep. This is an eternal plan that has grace alone written all over it. How wide, how deep, how high, how long is the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Welcome to the mountaintop. This is what we find in the heart of our God. It's that surprising love where it's least expected and it's on full display. Do you catch it? Do you sniff it? Because I have a feeling that if you're like me and you get into those ruts, you get in those times where you're just hurting people with your thoughts and you're not what you're supposed to be in a given room at a given time. You don't have the space for, other, for sinners in your life. That what's firing there is arrogance and this pride. And if I just went back to the real story, if I just climbed the hill as a beggar that I am, this miserable creature, and I was a sinner again today, and I'm going to hell today because I've used every thought in the book. And there God would say what he really and truly says and what he really and truly did. In our Lord Jesus Christ, I experienced firsthand, all over, afresh, the depth the deep stuff of this relationship with God. There's a huge reason why we must come back and start worship again if we claim to be without sin. You have no story. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. It's just surface stuff with no depth to it. It's just a lie. It's just a mirage. Nothing of the beauty. So we come back to this place and experience something totally new that has opened up for Christians. A totally new heart of the relationship and a heart that God alone puts inside. Do you hear what Paul then says in the middle of this? A Paul who could have, in the heart of Christianity, he could have boasted among the Jews. He could have bragged as an apostle to the Gentiles, but he did none of it. And he said, you know, as we explore why the Jews have totally missed the boat on God by their arrogance, he says, I pray for them. My heart, he's, listen to what he says, my heart's desire and my prayer is that they may be saved. Paul knows that one hand that says, save me, Lord, is linked to a hand that says, save them too. The prayer to God that says, forgive me, leads us also to pray, forgive them. The deep relationship I experienced in the forgiveness of God, who shouldn't have, but did, leads me to be someone you find doing stuff I shouldn't, but I do because I love you. 
so the knees bend, and a beginning of love is made. We pray for each other. And you go out those doors and you meet a world of people who will disappoint and frustrate and offend and trouble you. But there's room. There's room for sinners. There's room for those who are going to hell today. Because there's room for us. Brothers and sisters, I, I pray that we may not forget or grow cold to the heart on the mountain that we find in the love of God, but jump in the stream and ride that powerful current. Amen. Please stand.